All right, so uh, the topic today that I'm going to speak about is uh, sort of extension on, uh, or extension of a lot of the things that have already been discussed today um, around serverless and databases and uh, how, you, how you can build applications, next generation applications. But uh, the step further that I'm going to take it is really to talk about a new challenge, which is how do you build global services? So if you're going to build a global service, and uh, I just want a little audience participation here, so just feel free to yell out an answer. But what, what is the one problem that you simply cannot escape dealing with? Space. Space? Latency, yeah. So speed of light, right? Uh, fundamentally, if uh, you have customers that are in Australia and your service is in Virginia, you've got a problem. Um, in practice, in fact, it's much worse than the speed of light. You can only asymptotically approach that. There's all kinds of horrific network latencies involved. So you have the cellular, cellular network, which at 2G speeds was like a second plus. At 3G, it was something like uh, 100 to 500 milliseconds. Now at 4G, advanced LTE, it's less than 100 milliseconds. 5G is going to make that even better. Uh, that's still a pretty big chunk of uh, sort of any kind of critical path analysis of your end-to-end -end service latency. And then you've got regional backbones and, of course, intercontinental links, and these things add up quickly. So just as a, to make this more visceral and give you a, like a concrete way of thinking about it, this right here, map of the United States, has all of the cities with more than 100,000 people in them marked as a circle, and the actual size of population is, uh, you know, indicates, is indicated by the, the, the area of the circle. Um, we have here a, let's say, an application tier plus the database that's deployed in Richmond, Virginia. So even on the West Coast, things aren't trending so well. You have about 70 millisecond latency to get over to Richmond. So if you're in Los Angeles, uh, this, is what, this is sort of the minimum service latency you can get. And there, there, are, there are factors that can make it much worse than 70 milliseconds, as I'm sure everyone in here is aware. If you have a REST API and your mobile app is making multiple calls to it, uh, that, can, that, that can incur a sort of serial accumulation of these 70 millisecond latencies. And we've seen in various enterprises that we've worked with, cases where this uh, latency adds up to be multiple seconds because of these serial requests. If you actually have a user in Australia, and, and frankly, they've really gotten the short end of uh, the short straw um, over the last two decades of dealing with services, um, things look pretty grim, right? So if you're in Sydney, you've got to do a uh, link to LA and then an LA to Richmond to get to this service. So you have a minimum of 220 milliseconds for any kind of round trip uh, operation. So before we like dive into how that problem can be solved, Let's talk a little bit about the trends. Uh, everyone here is probably a believer in serverless, but if you go talk to the Fortune 500, not everyone agrees. Um, and actually, two years ago, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, was uh, you know pretty allergic to the public cloud. They they just started making a shift about two years ago. Uh, but I think at this point, most I'd say uh, educated observers of our ecosystem. Um, are pretty clear on the fact that you don't run your own data centers anymore. This just doesn't make sense in, in 2019. Um, but you know, the first launch of that with AWS wasn't the first launch of uh, you know, a uh, sort of public cloud type solution, but nevertheless, I'm just kind of have AWS's timeline up here for their various uh, releases. Uh, you know, it's been quite a gap before the Fortune 500 accepted that reality, that it's actually a, a better solution. RDS launched you know, four years after. I think right now the writing's on the wall that if you're a big tech, or not tech, but a, a big company of any sort, uh, you may not want to run your own database. Right? You may want to focus your resources on where you have a comparative advantage. If you're a bank, maybe you should be releasing a much better like, retail banking application, or, or more of them, more services for, to, keep, to basically win you know, competitive war that you're fighting. Um, and then in 2015, we have Lambda. So I think Fortune 500 type companies are pretty far from accepting a reality where uh, they're not going to control the application tier and deploy it themselves. Um, the question is, is it coming? Is it inevitable? Um, and, and frankly, I think these benefits provide the impetus for all of the previous sort of evolutions, the, the data center, the database, and it's going to apply to running applications as well because usage-based pricing is, is a heck of a lot cheaper for something that you're just putting out there. Uh, you don't have to buy whole instances. <laughs> Before, you had to buy a whole data center, so like the, 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 the compression is, is occurring every time there's a sort of a new advance here. But the time to value is the biggest one, and I already mentioned that. It's about can you create more services more quickly than your competitors? Because if you can, you'll win. And that's what's going to drive this. That's what makes this inevitable.
So globalization is the other uh, big thing. And first, I'll sort of focus on enablers and then challenges. Um, you know, there's open source software. So fundamentally, there's this globalization of ideas and infrastructure and technologies. And there's also app stores. So anything you write can basically reach an, a, a global audience overnight. So this is a huge difference from the days of shrink wrap software and the like. Also, the ability to have resources that are global. Uh, this is something that Google had in the aughts, but now every startup in the world has it. And you've got you know, all the, 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 the big ones that started in the US, but you've got you know, uh, new entrants that are making huge headway like Alibaba Cloud. And there's, there's many others, and it's countless. And of course, orchestration technology. So Kubernetes seems to have won that particular war, but there's already a, a whole host of the sort of next generation ones that are creating multi-cloud uh, control planes because uh, Kubernetes clusters are sort of inward looking still and uh, you, you do want to manage mul uh, lots of them depending on how complex your, your deployment's going to be. But there's challenges, fundamental challenges um, with globalization. That's not going to stop it, clearly, but they have to be overcome and they're adding complexity to all of our lives. There's been a huge trust breakdown and it doesn't seem like it's getting better. Right? Uh, G GDPR is uh, the EU's response to this, and it's an evolution of uh, some of the privacy protections that were in place previously that weren't considered good enough, especially after some of the Snowden revelations. There's been 109 companies since 2000, uh, up to 2015 that have implemented some form of data privacy regulations. So that's actually kind of a minefield for companies that are trying to enter new markets. And then, of course, we have a trust breakdown that's been fomented by the big tech companies that have sort of information monopolies in various places, like Google with search and Facebook with social. And uh, I think some of the stewardship that those companies have displayed have been lacking. And there's, uh, they're, they're always in the news nowadays. And I don't think most people feel very comfortable. And the user experience is another part of globalization that's a big challenge. If uh, you know, you're in Australia, for example, that latency becomes significant. And with the advent and adoption of 5G that's coming up, um, you know, a service for an Australian user that is you know, viscerally slower is something that is going to drive that user to a competitor that has a local experience. Privacy, of course, is, is the other big piece here. So in 2020, what does a global service actually have to look like? I, I, the way I think of it is if you're going to build a global service, that means that you're providing a local experience to customers no matter where they are on the planet. That's a pretty difficult thing to do if you're thinking about an end-to-end -end, uh, sort of service, all the different tiers that, that you might have to employ. Uh, you know, fundamentally, I think you want to get this to at least sort of a 100 millisecond mark to really enable for sort of next generation application use cases that are more latency sensitive. Um, they also, you also want your users to be able to trust that all of their data, especially the sensitive stuff, is going to be in their legal jurisdiction. So being able to make that claim as a provider, whether your customers are consumers or your SaaS business and their other companies, really makes a big difference. So if you're going to build a global service, you also want to make sure that it's holistic. And what I mean by that is that you're not going to build silos. You're not going to have, okay, we have our US service. Uh, that we're operating and monitoring, and we got our US database, and we got a US application tier, and now we're going to go into the EU, so we're going to build an EU service, and we're going to have an EU database and EU application service. That sort of is a pathway that leads to a uh, sort of a, probably a super linear cost structure, um, because you, you just have different failure modes that start to pop up, and your application developers have to build bridges between the different silos as soon as you want to have, say, a customer in Australia interacting with a customer in the UK. So you also want this to be straightforward to build and to operate. So when your developers are working with this, uh, whatever the infrastructure and platform that you're using to build a global service, you want them to think of it more locally. You don't want them to be aware, okay, this customer is in this place, and so I have to connect to this different database or have uh, use this uh, sort of different execution pathway. And, and, and fundamentally, you want to make sure for operators that when things go wrong in this system, or you, you have to get data from somewhere halfway across the world, this doesn't break anything, it merely degrades gracefully by increasing latency. So how do you do this? Well, the big thing when you're optimizing any sort of system is what's your critical path, and what's the biggest component of your critical path? Right? If, if, you, if you tack and optimize a component of your critical path that counts for 5% of the total latency, that's the most you can possibly improve it. If you attack the component that is accounting for 60 or 70 percent of your total latency, you can make a huge difference. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, I mean, the ultimate way, and it's the way that I'm going to propose, 
is that you eliminate geographic latencies, at least the, the big ones where you can, in the common case. There's cases where you just are simply going to be unable to do that, but you want that to be the common case, like 90% of the time, 95% of the time. And you do this by making sure the app tier is close to the customer. You also have to make sure the data is close to the customer. So moving the app tier close to the customer is pretty simple. We all know how to do that. These are stateless application servers. You just need to spin up more of them closer to your users regionally. Uh, the consistent access to global state, that's the hard fundamental problem that needs to be solved here. Um, you, wanna, you want to effectively make a new assumption, which is that every piece of data that you're interested in has a location attached to it. And you can use that to really fundamentally control how data is domiciled around the world. So there's this new requirement that emerges from this, and it's something that you know, CockroachDB has been focused on now for uh, probably about three of the four and a half years that we've been, we've been in, in operation, and that's building a geo-distributed database. There's various components of that which I'm going to talk about. So it's sort of the founding building block, and I don't talk about this as this becomes more complex. You're just going to have to assume that this is part of uh, every one of the follow-on slides. But you want to have resilience. In other words, business continuity. You want to be able to accept the loss of a data center. These things happen, potentially even a region. And that means you're going to have no data loss. You're going to have sub, or sort of single-digit seconds of failover time, what's called a recovery time objective. Uh, and you know, fundamentally, what, what you're trying to avoid is post-mortems. Right? Many companies have 50 external applications running in a particular data center. If that goes down, and you have the potential for data loss, that's a lot of displaced productivity, and it's a lot of morale. Could be dollars and cents as well. So how does this work with something like Cockroach? And this, this sort of uh, new kind of replication is the new standard, really. It's not how Oracle Golden Gate works, but it is how Amazon Aurora works. It's how Google Spanner works. It's how Cockroach works. Um, and, and most of the new breed of uh, what people call new SQL databases employ something like this. It's consensus replication, something like Paxos or Raft, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But effectively, you're saying, I need the majority of my replication sites to be available, and I can lose the minority. So in this case, we're sort of zoomed up on that idea of 100,000 plus population cities. We have a three data center deployment on the east coast of the United States. We have a user coming from Nashville, Presumably, they're going to find the closest data center where their application tier is, and there's cockroach nodes there. Uh, then if there's a write involved in the operation, some sort of transaction, that has to be replicated to at least one, of the, one additional of the three data centers. So you'll have two out of three. As soon as that happens, you're good to go. So if they're both up, Richmond and Durham, it's going to take 13 and a half milliseconds. You can do that transaction. You can return success to the user. So it's nice and fast. If Durham goes away, then it's going to have to rely on the Richmond data center. So that would be 16 and a half milliseconds. So things are still really wonderful, right? You've, you, know, you have a negligible additional amount of latency, but you have a, uh, a, completely, uh, a complete business continuity here. When we zoom out, though, things don't even look so good in the US. And, and, and here, the latency spectrum has been um, reconfigured. In the previous slides, I showed you it was 250 milliseconds. Here, the red is at 100 milliseconds. So you can see that over in California, for this East Coast deployment, we actually start to flirt with um, you know, 70 millisecond latencies. So there's a solution to this, and we call it geopartitioning. Effectively, what you do for the US base is you'd have West Coast users, Central US users, and East Coast users. Um, so in this case, it's Salt Lake City, Fort Worth, and Charlotte. Now you can see that every one of these cities in the United States has a, has a very sort of 30 millisecond-esque latency to the nearest data center, the nearest application stack that you have deployed. Um, with geopartitioning, we do something additional, which is that when a user is creating data, they have either west, central, or east coast assigned to their account and to their whole hierarchy of data. So that means that a user coming in from Los Angeles is going to be labeled a west coast user, and they're going to go to Salt Lake City, as long as Salt Lake City is available. And that's where they're going to be able to read their data with millisecond latencies. Uh, and you know, of course, when they do a write operation, in this particular case, we just have three replication sites, it's going to have to wait for Fort Worth to come back. Uh, 
that's about a 30 millisecond latency. So I think things are, things are good. Um, you're guaranteed these very fast read latencies so you can populate a page or you know, handle anything that's read only um, with you know, essentially just the round trip between Los Angeles and Salt Lake City, which is something about 20 milliseconds. If you have a write operation, um, because you're doing all the reads locally and everything, you have that 20 milliseconds plus the 30 millisecond round trip to Fort Worth. So it's 50 milliseconds. So things are really good in this case. Same with Omaha, Nebraska, and Philadelphia uh, on the East Coast. This all works. In the Omaha case, of course, that's a central user, and their data is going to be sort of led by the replication site that's in Fort Worth, and similarly for Philadelphia and Charlotte. But let's zoom out again. Right? Things look pretty grim for the rest of the world. So you know, how do you solve this? How do you really build a global service? So now we're talking about doing geopartitioning on a, on a wider scale in order to get true global data localization. So in this deployment, we have 17 data centers. <laughs> right, this, is a, this is kind of a flabbergasting sort of number when you know, most people operate their th system out of a single data center, maybe with a, a, a warm backup somewhere else. Uh, so 17 data centers, um, this is actually a, a customer of ours, um, and, and they're using the public cloud. That that's, that's makes this, you know, no company in the right mind besides perhaps some of the world's biggest multinationals have ever had 17 data centers, but now a startup can have them. So the way that this works is effectively EU users, their data is replicated amongst London, Berlin, and Barcelona. Uh, Chinese customers replicated uh, across Shanghai, Berlin, or Shanghai, Beijing, and uh, Shenzhen. And same with Australian, US, and South American users. Uh, so you know, what, what you're relying on here is that 90, 95% of the time, there's extreme data locality. That means that an Australian user using a gaming uh, service of some sort, is, is they're, all their data is going to be in Australia. And so that, that's going to be very quick if they're just interacting with their own data. If they're playing with other players, they're probably going to be playing with their friends and their family who are probably in Australia. Right? Or just random people, and it's going to connect them with people that are closer if it can. Um, if they do have a friend that's in the UK, or they're traveling, then the latencies go up, but they still work fundamentally. So as you can see, in the, in the European case, we have roughly 20 millisecond latencies. Australia, it's roughly you know, 26 milliseconds in the worst case, and 16 milliseconds in a good case. So, so everything's, it's like we've, we, we, we took these things that were 200, 300 milliseconds, if you only have a single round trip, and we've, we've been able to say for a common case, we're getting them back down to under 30 milliseconds, globally. But there's a huge, huge challenge that remains here. This, this is great, right? We have this amazing geo-partitioning, uh, geo-distributed database. Uh, but let's say that you're a growth company or even a startup. You know, deploying to 17 data centers is going to be, you, you know, let's say that Cockroach, is, the company, has a managed service offering, which we do, that's actually able to span all of these uh, data centers. Um, you still have the challenge of deploying to 17 data centers, which probably means 51 VMs for your application tier because you want to have uh, or at least you know, um, uh, you know, two in each of the data centers and a load balance. There's a lot of configuration. That's all, 17 different Kubernetes clusters you're probably running. Um, you know, it, there's, no, there's no easy way to, to figure out how you're going to make that price acceptable or the operational overhead. But because of serverless, uh, there is actually a, a very clear path forward that has a hugely valuable um, proposition for uh, uh, any, any user. So there's you know, really this idea that serverless, as it's mostly constituted now, you know, things like uh, AWS Lambda and Google Cloud Functions, they're coming out of one availability zone. But that's changing, it's changing quickly. Uh, there are companies now that are pushing sort of the, the global Lambda um, idea and the concept. Um, but there's three different strategies that, that kind of fall on a spectrum, both of, like, I think, how desirable they are and how broadly applicable they are. Um, the first one, which I think is probably the least applicable, is you could hyper-converge your application tier with Cockroach. So if you were running Cockroach yourself, let's say you're a big bank and you're self-hosting Cockroach, which most of them still want to do. They don't want our managed service offering. They want to do it themselves. Uh, they would have the ability to take their application logic and sort of compose it into a Kubernetes pod and throw it all out there. So effectively, their, their application tier is co-located with a Cockroach database node. And that application tier just talks to localhost right, on, on the right port to, to find Cockroach. And uh, that, you know, that just will naturally uh, co-locate their, their data and their application logic. 
Um, there, this is also, the reason I think it's not very applicable is it's, it's very disruptive, right? There, there, it is very useful often to have uh, more of a clean separation between your application tier and your, and your database tier. Um, every time you wanted to push a new version of your application, for example, you'd have to push a new Kubernetes pod, which means you're doing essentially rolling restarts of actual database nodes, which Cockroach is good at, but it's not something you necessarily want to do as often as you want to update your application logic. Another option is to embed Lambda into the database. So, uh, you know, we, <laughs> we, we just heard about stored procedures going out of vogue, and most of our customers are simply allergic in the Fortune 500 to stored procedures because they've suffered under their yoke for decades now. Um, but it is true that if you can embed a Lambda-type environment into the database, that you sort of have a trivial win here. I mean, your application logic easily follows the data, which is the goal. Right? Data is the primary thing. That's what really matters. Application logic just needs to, to, make, to be co-located. So this is, this is a really elegant solution. And I think it's a good one, but it's only a point on the spectrum. I think the, the most applicable and the one that's probably going to um, be the future choice for most companies is, is really that you know, something like a geo-distributed cockroach service will need to integrate with the various global Lambda providers, whether that's, you know, I say global Lambda, but global serverless, right? whether that's something like Lambda or functions or it's uh, unikernels that are as a service, or Docker as a service, things like that. So what's the sort of new value proposition that we're talking about? Really, we're allowing companies to enter new markets that may have data sovereignty complexities. Probably do, in fact. I think there's an Accenture report that came out last year that found that 75% of companies were either planning to abandon, or, um, abandon plans or exit markets because of data sovereignty complexity. Um, also, you know, this allows you to fundamentally align with customer um, desires. So latency, which again, uh, you know, is you know, important, but also I think the legal jurisdiction component here. And, and if you're a company that has a SaaS business, this is incredibly important because your, your customers are whole companies with uh, you know, all of their sort of financial information, information about their employees, which is, there's like this sort of an explosion of liability there. So that legal jurisdiction becomes quite important. And then of course, these 5G is going to enable a lot of new use cases, right? There's AR, VR, there's self-driving, um, there's you know, some more interactive entertainment options where you know, you're really gonna feel the bite when you have 5G on your phone and this thing takes 500 milliseconds to come back with a response. I think uh, when I was working, I, I was at Google for about 10 years from 2002 to 2012, and in the early days, they were maniacally focused on keeping the end-to-end -end latency for search low, because they discovered, like repeatedly in experiments, that if the latency crept over about 250 milliseconds, they lost users. Search volume went down. And these things matter even in the days when everyone had horrible latencies. With these new use cases, if you can't make your latencies under 100 milliseconds, you will lose users to your competitors. So what does that mean for the new customer promise? This is my favorite thing. If you can build this kind of a global service, what you're really delivering is the ability to do less than 100 millisecond, and that's really right now just because LTE is basically gonna cost you about 100 milliseconds. But you could do less than 100 milliseconds end end latency for any customer in the world. I mean, maybe not people in the research lab at, in Antarctica, but you know, for most of your potential users, which is a, a pretty big win. And, and for operators, what you're talking about is deploying a global service in minutes. It's like, give, you, give, you give us the code, we're going to deploy it globally, scale it, and your data is going to be, the, the, the service is gonna be available to your, to your users uh, you know, with an end-to-end -end latency that actually is incredibly attractive. And, and further, both for the data tier and the logic tier, you're gonna pay only for what you use. So this is, a, this is a huge step forward, sort of like a, a 10x, um, the sort of 10x in, in evolution improvement that we're looking for. So that's, that's it. So if anyone wants to talk about that again, I, I will be at the barbecue, so be happy to entertain questions. Thank you.